Long ago, in the mists of time, I worked rather unhappily in the corporate environment and there was a horrible saying that was fail to plan and you plan to fail. It was one of those cliches. But now that I'm a happy artist, I say 10 minutes of planning saves you two hours of heartache. And how do we plan our watercolours? Well, we do something called a thumbnail sketch. Nothing magic. It's just a scrappy little sketch that helps you visualise where you want to get to. And then we can paint knowing where we want to get to and how we're going to get there. My name is Liz Chatterton. I'm a watercolour artist based in Berkshire. Every week I share a tip or trick I wish I'd known about ages ago. And this week it's all about how thumbnails can improve our watercolour paintings. So what is a thumbnail? Well, to start with, it certainly isn't a thing of beauty. It's not a finished piece of artwork. It's a doodle, maybe a little more than a doodle, but it's it's a plan to help you succeed in your painting. So you get to know your subject, you get to know your shapes, you get to know where the light's coming from, and you do all that at the beginning rather than starting to paint and realising there's a problem. What I'd love to do is to show you some of the pictures that resulted from these thumbnails. So first up we've got a couple of kingfishers and I just love the angles of their beak on that one. And then we've got this stag and I made it quite wintry with that background so it felt like it was snowing. This basset, I just love the light along its nose, that was the attraction. And then the llama, it was those banana ears. So let's see a thumbnail in, in practice. So imagine yourself, you've gone out for a walk and you've seen this lovely old, old dilapidated barn. You think, oh, that'd be a great subject for a painting. Of course you could just paint the barn. And you think, oh, that's really boring because it's just plonked in the middle. Of course, you could then think, no, I want to set it in the landscape, like that slopey ground. And I could do that. I'm starting to notice the two sort of angles of that roof, how that sticks out more dark that we've got going on. And I could put it in more of a landscape and I could think, yeah, yeah, I'll put, I'll put some trees behind it. And oh, I don't know, maybe I'll add in a nice old fence. But you might still think, it's still pretty boring actually. Don't like where it's set in, in the piece of paper. And you could carry on doing this and doing different compositions and playing around with elements and so forth. Of course you could. Or even better, you could look at this and say, mm, why is it that I want to paint this? What attracts me to it? And I, I personally, I love how the light is caught on that roof and I love the verticals and the more horizontal lines. I love all the different lines of it. So I might think, let's forget the traditional landscape shape. Let's change things round. Would this work better in vertical? You know, why? I like the slope of that land so I could maybe set it in sort of context and I like as I say that roof I might actually give a bit more bow to it let's make this a really dilapidated barn so my planning process this thumbnail would help me think yeah that might work better to capture the story of why I like this. How can I lead the viewer up to this and how can I emphasise that I think this is a really interesting barn that's worth diverting from the walk I'm on to go to it? Well, I could do that by maybe using some leading lines. Maybe this should be a ploughed field in front and leads me up to this shed. I really liked that captured light behind it so I do need some sort of darker trees but I don't want this to look foreboding I want it to look inviting 
So I won't make those into sort of dense forests where the wolves might be lurking. I might just make these sort of quite light and maybe leave some air gaps in them so that, that it feels lighter. Maybe I need to bring the fence along the, the front like this so that we have to go. I want that feeling of the viewer has to. They're just drawn up to this. That might be nice. It's also great to do at this point, and I'll do you a neater version, is to think, OK, I'm starting to narrow down what I want to do. Let's look at big shapes and let's look at big tones. Where is the light and the dark to help me tell my story? So if I've said that I love the light there and it's got to be dark behind but not oppressive, Perhaps I could bring some of the trees down a bit so that there's more light going through. Where is that light coming from? Well, that's really dark there. So it, it, the light is sort of coming from there and I could start to see where the, the light would be and where the shadows and the darks are because we need in any picture really dark, sort of medium, and light values and I've got to think about those so that's a big dark there that could then link to this dark here that could link to that dark there and suddenly I've got some an interesting shape going on this behind doesn't have to be too dark but maybe we'll introduce some dark here and maybe some, I said, some fence posts. So those could come out negatively. And I'm thinking of those shapes and how then I might link, because I do like that sort of echo of, of the hill. So it's definitely going up and I could even link some of this dark here so that I've got this interesting shape going on there with my dark. I want to bring that foreground forward so I, I don't know I might have some rocks and pebbles and more texture in this ploughed field that would get smaller and smaller up here. And I'm thinking what to leave out. You'll notice that I haven't put this big tree in doesn't really interest me and I don't think it helps the composition. I think if you put a tree here the lines would lead to the tree rather than to to the barn. So what can I leave out? What can I put in? What helps me take my tell my story? And now in this planning process how can I achieve this? You know, Do I need to mask off that light area? No because it's a big area and I've just got to remember not to uh, paint over it. You know, do I need to mask off anything in this? Well, no. But if I did, then in terms of order, I would think, oh, yes, masking off. And if you don't know what I mean by masking, please do look at the, the film that I'm going to link in the comments. I might want to get some of that background in pretty early on because that's going to define my roof. This is what we would call a found edge, because by painting the background, I'm going to find that. So I might do the distant trees. And I think I'm going to work on, on the barn because I want to get a little bit of detail in there. And then I'm going to come forward for that foreground. I don't tend to really number things out but if it helps you, do. Let me show you another example. I put together this little reference sheet for a recent workshop that I did. I quite often will find lots of references and if something isn't terribly clear, I really wasn't sure what was happening with its eye, I'll go and look for something that does make it clearer. So this little seahorse, why do I like it? 
Well, that curl of the tail is just gorgeous. Love this long snout here, a lot more than I like the snout there. But I love these spikes on this drawing and the idea that this is a seahorse, but it's almost like a sea dragon. And I love how this little puffed out chest here. Here it's got a fat belly, here it's got a puffed out chest. I'm looking at this and thinking, those are the things I love. How can I capture them? And I might think, oh, I'm doing the seahorse and they're so tiny. Perhaps, actually, I could do, you know, a little seahorse in the, the huge ocean. So the, do it high up and small in a, a big piece of paper here because that would give the feeling of how small it is in the vast ocean. Or I might like the idea of it having a purpose so this little seahorse is because it's the uh the male seahorses that give birth to the the young i can't remember the exact uh, biology of it but i i know that so it's a very busy seahorse lots of things to do lots of babies to sort out and maybe it's going somewhere so i might put it in that that context or i might just love that little seahorse and think no actually I want him to be the star of the show and I will do him big in the piece of paper so he absolutely is the star of the show and I think that is what what we'll do. So wanted more of a puff, puffed out chest rather than a puffed out belly. I want that lovely well I think probably an even tighter circle uh, spiral there and just thinking what the shape is here. Mustn't forget that lovely sort of dorsal fin. Let's make that quite a snouty nose and then it comes up, put on some, some spikes. So this isn't a seahorse that I think you'll ever actually find in the sea. This is a slightly Frankenstein seahorse. I've taken the bits I like and uh, combined them but I really like on this seahorse that spine and the sort of scales down its back and I do love the spots now the light because it's underwater will be coming from above so I'm thinking about tone I think it will all be pretty diffused because it is underwater so I don't think that's got to be a huge concern of mine but it's it's worth sort of thinking where there might be some shadow. So I've thought of format and I've thought of size and I've thought of what's important to me and started to map that out and then I might start thinking yeah, I want this to look like it's floating in the water. So I'm going to have sort of just wafts of colour and waves of colour to it's floating in the water. But there's always little bits of plankton and amoeba and goodness knows what floating around. So I need a few bits in there. And there's deep bubbles as well. This is my thought process. I'm trying to articulate what I would be thinking in those sort of five, ten minutes of planning. And I think, well, how am I going to achieve this? What's the, an efficient, enjoyable way of achieving this? I don't want to paint little baby jellyfish. I know I could just spatter in some masking fluid to save little white dots. Oh, sorry. What have I written there? And I would need to do that first if I wanted to do that. And then I love, as I say, this spine and those sort of separate little sort of plates of armour down its back. So I could do that by painting wet up to wet. So I'd paint a square of one colour, then a square of another, and then join them on so that the fluid just flows down and I get all those mingles and merges. And then maybe I could use like the handle of my brush just to pull out some spikes from those mingles and merges while it's all wet. So that probably would be the second thing I'd do. And then while this is all wet, I want areas of softness compared to maybe these will have some quite hard edges. So I'll do as 
belly and his chest all quite soft and then spatter in while it's drying so I get some soft marks and then let it dry a bit more and spatter in a bit more to get these lovely dots so I might do that next as you can hear from my voice I'm, I'm starting to think oh this is exciting this is what I want to do and I mustn't forget this lovely fin here but it is very see-through so oh I could lose this edge here I don't want to lose it totally but I want to have hard edges and soft edges found edges and lost edges I want to have areas of definition and areas of softness in any painting however simple it is so I think I might do that next and lose that edge uh, if I lose it too much I can always go back in and just define a little of those lines and maybe look it's got some markings down the back and that'll just stop it being a bl blob on his back and I'll come up to this head and make sure he gets these lovely horns and so forth do that and then I need the background and these wafts of colour out that's super then I'll take the masking off uh, so let's say remove masking and then I'll just refine it I'll have 80 90 percent of it done but then I'll just refine things maybe use my rigger just to to capture in some edges a little bit of spatter to get some very defined dots and then I'll be there so that will be another way of using the thumbnail to work out what I want to say and the story I want to tell and for me it's all about this beautiful seahorse floating in its water I plan it say I this tends to go on in my head rather than articulating it but when you're starting to use watercolor it's a really good idea to actually think logically how you want to paint it and you know if you're right-handed like I am Often it is good to start on the left and work to the right because then you're not going to smudge it all. It's wet, you're going to put your, your arm in it. Or as we saw with the, the landscape, it's often a good idea to start at the back and come forwards. So, you know, work out some of that plan. Something good happens, deviate from it. Something bad happens, find a solution. And by following that plan, you know, I came up with this little seahorse in, it probably only took 20, 30 minutes to, to paint because I knew where I was going and I knew how to get there and also when to stop because here I have a beautiful seahorse floating in the water. That's what I wanted to do. Good, I can stop. Whereas if he looked a bit static and like he was pinned to a pad in a museum I'd have needed to keep going and that is the power of thumbnails and what I would urge you though with thumbnails is to actually use them you've gone through that process and you thought of it don't now put it out of the way while you start on your real painting I occasionally in classes I say to people oh have you done a thumbnail and they go oh yeah Liz yeah yeah I've done a thumbnail and I say, oh, where is it? Oh, it's in my bag. And you're like, no, no, this is a plan that you're meant to take with you. That's a bit like getting a map for your Sunday afternoon walk and leaving the map at home. Take it with you. Don't be frightened to deviate if something good happens and it will really increase your chances of success.